Hello, this is Neil Hansen. I'm a diagnostic radiologist in Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm here to give you a talk on MRI image characteristics and artifacts. I don't use live polling during these YouTube talks. However, within the description of the video, you can click on a link. That link will take you to a Poll Everywhere quiz. I encourage you to do those quizzes as we go along. Uh, and to click through and answer it. It'll give you time to stop, think, and apply what you're learning. It'll also give you a chance to wake up and click something so you don't fall asleep. References. So there's lots of good references for MRI, which I've really covered in other talks. Again, I am not an expert, so just like this guy says, okay, Mrs. Dunn, we'll slide you in there, scan your brain, and see if we can find out why you've been having these spells of claustrophobia. Uh, if you've never been in an MRI, it is terrible. My goals here are really just to get you through artifacts that you'll see on a daily basis, know how to manage them as a diagnostic radiologist, and then to answer, of course, a few multiple choice questions to get you through your certifying exams. Here's the Poll Everywhere link, should the link in the YouTube video not be working. All right, artifacts. There's lots of artifacts that you'll see uh, daily in the clinical workflow. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of artifacts that you need to know about, but quite honestly, you'll probably never see in real life because the technologist sees them and modifies or changes things before it even makes it to your uh, workstation and pack. So learning about these artifacts in theory is very important because many of them you may never actually see in real life because the technologist will have fixed everything by the time it reaches you. I want you to be able to recognize it, talk about the basic physics of the artifacts cause and how to use it to diagnose things or alternatively prevent and minimize it so that you can make the diagnosis on the uh, good quality images. All right, first question. The correct answer is decreasing field strength going from 3 to 1.5 Tesla. So this was a picture that shows the artifact dielectric effect. This is where there's low signal shading near the center of the field of view that you can see here. The physics behind it is there, uh, this signal artifact or low uh, signal area is caused by variation in tissue conductivity and signal uniformity. This is actually worse at higher field strengths or three Tesla. So if this is seen on the initial images uh, obtained uh, at our institution, for example, the technologist will frequently take them from a three Tesla scanner to a 1.5 Tesla scanner to try and minimize it. When does the dielectric effect occur? Well, it occurs anywhere where there's lots of high signal stuff. So uh, large water volumes. So think about ascites patients with cirrhosis or uh, pregnant patients with lots of amniotic fluid, uh, really obese patients, and especially those with a lot of intra-abdominal fat, it can happen as well. How do you fix this? Well, you can move down to 1.5 Tesla. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll do a paracentesis uh, in an ascites uh, patient before we image them uh, to get rid of it and minimize it. There are dielectric pads uh, which help fix this. And then some of the newer fancier scannies, scanners can have multi-channel transmission and mathematical reconstruction ways to get rid of it. Uh, but this is the dielectric effect. Here is your next question. So I want you to just name this artifact. So what is the correct answer? It's herringbone. That is the herringbone artifact. Some people also will call this crisscross artifact or corduroy artifact. It looks like a series of crisscrosses across the screen. The cause is basically electromagnetic spikes with a fluctuating power supply, or it could be cause related to a radio frequency pulse discrepancy. Remember, there are multiple radio frequency pulses obtaining signal along the various lines of the matrix. How do you fix this? Well, uh, initially what the technologist does is usually just repeats the sequence and oftentimes it'll go away if it's related to just like a power dip. Uh, but if it recurs repetitively and can't be fixed, you really have to call a service representative because it means there's something inherently wrong with your equipment setup. This is what herring bones looks like. Uh, I think this is a terribly named artifact because it doesn't really look like herring bones. 
Uh, when I saw this, I originally immediately thought it was stupidly named, but it's not the first thing in medicine that's stupidly named, so moving on. <laughs> Which sequence tends to have this artifact the worst? The correct answer is a GRE sequence, GRE. What is this? These are moray fringes, so these curvilinear banding appearance. So these things here, you see those? Those are the artifact that we're talking about, moray fringes. It's caused uh, uh, really the lack of perfect homogeneity in a magnetic field. So if you think about our body, left versus right, um, it's different. There are different organs. They have different magnetic susceptibilities locally. You may have surgical clips asymmetrically on one side of the body. More frequently, this occurs in the body than in the brain because inherently the body is asymmetric, right? The brain is much more symmetric in terms of uh, what's there usually. And it, this is usually seen on an abdominal GRE sequence. It le these uh, local magnetic field inhomogeneities leads to phase additions and cancellations. So where the, the, there's additions, you get bright bands. Where there's cancellations, you get dark bands. How do you fix this? Well, you use a non-GRE sequence. So like if you wanted to look at this area um, that has the signal artifact, like down here, you could just look on like a T2 weighted image, like a single shot fast spin echo sequence, which tends not to get this moray fringe artifact. Or you could use something called shimming. Uh, shimming is, uh, I'll go over that here in a second. Uh, but again, like, you know, if you look at a GRE sequence here where you're getting susceptibility artifact related to an IVC filter, you're looking at these moray fringes in the periphery here. You do a T2 weighted single shot fast spin echo and all those artifacts go away because they're not as big of a problem on this pole sequence. So you just use a different sequence to evaluate those areas. What is shimming? So shimming is a fancy way of saying a correction of inhomogeneity of the MRI magnetic field. It is, uh, involves something, it could be a passive shim. So that's where you add or remove steel components within a magnet to fine tune fields. Uh, the, oftentimes passive shimming is set up while the magnet is installed. So after a MRI machine is installed, the uh, physicists and uh, technicians uh, assembling the machine will move around these coils uh, or remove these steel components to try and get the magnetic field uniform within it because inherently whatever room you put it in isn't going to have a perfect local magnetic uh, field within it, uh, right? Because no room is entirely symmetric, etc. Or you can do something called an active shim. That's where shim coils are used to carry small auxiliary currents to compensate for local field inhomogeneities. Uh, that's a little bit fancier active way of doing things. Shimming to me is what I do when I do any sort of construction process at my house uh, because I do not know how to measure correctly. You don't have to measure correctly if you buy enough shimming material. You just under measure a little bit and jam this stuff in there. <laughs> So here you go. This artifact is a consequence of what? The correct answer is a problem with the Fourier transceiver. Uh, and the artifact is right here. So if you look at this, this is where the artifact was if you had trouble identifying it. I find historically a lot of people miss this. They guess pulsation. You know that this isn't pulsation artifact because pulsation artifact should be in that uh, phase encoding direction. Uh, so if you look at this, this is not directly in line either in the AP direction or the transverse direction with these uh, internal carotid uh, arteries or the uh, basilar artery here. All right, so this is a problem with the Fourier transform. This is called central point artifact, and this one actually happens to be conveniently named because it's in the central point of the MRI sequence. It's a focal dot of signal in the center of the image, exactly in the center. The physics of this, it's a result of the Fourier transformation and an error within it. It's related to DC voltage constant offsets in the receiver. How do you fix it? Well, oftentimes you just repeat the sequence and it goes away. But if you repeat the uh, sequence and it recurs, 
uh, really you have to call a service repairman, which is how you have to fix a lot of these in real life, right? If something goes over and over and over and you can't figure it out. Uh, MRI software compensates for this and adjusts data in case space. Um, so it's really infrequently seen now with most good MR software. <laughs> Correct answer here is close the MRR room door. This is actually the zipper artifact. So zipper artifacts are where one or more spurious bands of noise appear perpendicular to the frequency encoding direction. It's present in all images acquired, so not just a single image. The cause, well, there's a variety of hardware and software causes, but usually this is related to a radio frequency artifact from some sort of medical equipment that's nearby. Um, oftentimes, like if the MR door gets left a little ajar, the MR door actually, if you've ever opened and closed them, uh, they're kind of heavy because they, uh, they're um, not a normal door. Uh, they're designed to maximize magnetic field homogeneity. So if they're not closed, then things outside like a pull socks machine or whatever is outside the door, uh, even the metal from the patient's bed um, could cause these kind of... Uh, interferences. Usually they're from radio frequency artifact though. Uh, one of the recent MR scanners that we had installed had this artifact and it couldn't be found. Like what was causing it? What was causing it? And then uh, after the uh, everyone worked through it, it actually turned out that the uh, clock uh, that was put on the wall for the decor in the wall uh, was a digital clock. Uh, that used technology, you know, so it could wirelessly be uh, reset and reprogrammed and automatically calibrated for uh, time changes and thing. And it was sending off a signal that was uh, interfering. So we had to get rid of that clock. Why do you even need a clock in that room? I don't know. All right. Uh, so how do you fix a zipper artifact? Well, one, normally the MR scanner door gets shut or uh, an obvious electronic device was left somewhere or maybe the patient uh, forgot and brought something in the room with them. Uh, you know, so you fix that, repeat the sequence, but if it's uh, pervasive, you really have to call a service repairman. <laughs> Here we go. So what is this? This is slice overlap artifact right here. This dark curvilinear band through the paravertebral muscles. And you'll see here the key to this artifact is that um, uh, the, um, the images acquired were obtained according to a disk protocol. So if you look here, um, the, these are not straight axial images. They're obtained within the plane of the intervertebral discs looking for things like herniations, uh, central canal stenosis. And at the area where the artifact occurred, where that low signal band is, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the slices that were acquired. So this is also known as crosstalk artifact. It's just low signal horizontal bands at an overlapping point of uh, slice acquisition. The result, or this results as a loss of signal in a multi-angle, multi-site acquisition. The physics behind it, if two levels, for example, this space is here, are acquired at the same time or very near each other, then the radio frequency pulse spins cancel out, and while they're designed to give signal, um, they actually cancel each other out and result in signal loss. How do you fix this? Well, you just eliminate the overlap in the areas of interest, or you acquire sections at different times or you just do a straight axial slice, or you, um, you just wait longer in between slice acquisitions for uh, appropriate um, uh, phasing to occur. All right, cross excitation uh, artifact, uh, to go into it a little bit more, it doesn't just affect um, sites that are uh, you know conventionally looked at like there where it's an angulation problem. Uh, if you think about an MRI, you can get this cross excitation artifact at the top portion or bottom portion of an acquisition if you don't have an appropriate gap. So the gap is just the space in between the parts of the body that are uh, not, not imaged, right? So radio frequency pulses are imperfect and uh, in reality they're somewhat curved lead, leading to unintended overlap in between slices that you select. 
Um, this can cause a loss of signal due to excitation from adjacent slice cancellations. Uh, it's most conspicuous on inversion recovery sequences. How do you fix this? Well, oftentimes you don't see this because when we design the sequence protocol, uh, we set the protocol up to eliminate it. And really your minimum gap has to be at least a third of the slice thickness for a contiguous slice. Uh, the other way that you can do this is to use 3D imaging, uh, which uh, by definition doesn't have uh, gaps in your image acquisition. It's just a whole volumetric box. Uh, you can also use interleaf slices. Uh, that's another way to prevent this crosstalk or cross excitation artifact. <laughs>
So lo and behold, here we actually have something that's clinically relevant. So I've seen this artifact, which is the entry site phenomenon. Correct answer is the entry site phenomenon, where there appears to be T1 hyperintense products within, uh, in this example, I think this was the external iliac or femoral vein. Um, uh, here, so like thrombus is T1 hyperintense. There's T1 hyperintense material here. I have actually seen people mistakenly call this thrombus, which prompted a DVT scan ultrasound, which turned out to be negative, uh, just because they were unaware of this artifact. So note clinical relevance. Uh, entry site phenomenon. So what is entry site phenomenon? It's, well, it's related to flow. And the physics are where there are unsaturated protons entering into the first couple slices of an image in between RF pulses and signal detection. So it results in a bright signal that fades with distance. And don't confuse it with thrombosis. If you think about it, we're acquiring this image slice right here, right? But uh, flow isn't going to stop just because we're doing an MRI. So in the split second between when we send in the RF pulse and when we listen for signal, all of these protons, which were you know, saturated here uh, within this slice, have moved because of flow out of the area. This tends to happen at the uh, very uh, edge of the image um, uh, because obviously everything within the image is still going to be uh, exposed to the radio frequency pole. So this is usually the first slice or two of the image that's acquired. So if you think you're going to call thrombus, uh, preferentially at the edge of the image, and think you're making a swing call, think again, think that it might just be the entry slice phenomenon. How do you fix this? Well, number one, I look at all pole sequences. Also, you just use intuitiveness. So, um, you know, you're going to look here for thrombosis on a T2-weighted image, see if the area was covered pre and post contrast, see if this is uh, looks like an acute thrombus, is it expansile? Um, or, you know, is it uh, an isolated abnormality on one image at the entry point on slice number one? You know, then I would just say to you, ignore it. If you cause it, or if you see it while the person is still um, uh, in the MRI machine, you can put on a spatial SAP AM, but usually that's not really necessary. <laughs>
Uh, what we do uh, to do this, to get differentiation between these two, is we take an echo time that's selected in which uh, fat and water are completely out of phase and cancel each other out. And then at that fat water interface in the same box hole, uh, it's all canceled out. Chemical shift artifact is an important artifact to know about, so I take a lot of time kind of learning about this one. The, what is the outer phase? So outer phase echo times differ at 1.5 and 3 tesla. At 1.5 tesla, the cancellation times occur at 4.5 second intervals, so 2.3, 6.8, 11.3. The, those times are different at 3 tesla. How do you use this? Well, you can establish something as a macroscopic fat containing mass, like an angiomyolipoma. How do you fix it? Well, you just choose the T1 in phase constants. So instead of imaging at 2.3, 6.8, or 11.3, you image at 9 or 13.5 um, uh, milliseconds instead. Uh, and that'll get rid of them. You can do fat suppression. So if you suppress all signal from fat, then obviously you're not going to have a fat water interface. The physics behind this uh, was difficult for me to appreciate at first, so I'm going to go into a little bit more depth. So let's say you have uh, three adjacent pixels or voxels, would probably be a better term for a 3D rep representation. In this pixel you have only water, in this pixel you have only fat. Both of them are bright on the given uh, sequence that we're talking about, let's say for example, so a T2-weighted sequence. And then in between you have a pixel that has half water and half fat. But because water and fat uh, have slightly different resonant frequencies, when you hit them with a radio frequency pulse, if you go to uh, time 1.1, they're going to be 90 degrees opposite each other. Uh, so they'll be uh, both kind of generating signal. But if you go to 2.2 seconds, they're exactly opposite each other. And so any signal generation is going to be um, canceled out and that's what causes that black line because there's signal cancellations there. At 3.3 seconds uh, they're 90 degrees to each other and then at 4.4 seconds they're exactly back in phase and when they're back in phase they're contributing signal back to each other. So they're out of phase here, they're in phase here, right? Uh, signals canceling out, black, signals adding together, bright. That's the basics of in and out of phase imaging. So actually chemical shift artifact is so important uh, clinically and it's kind of rare to talk in something in physics that is really this important. And I'm going to show this quick uh, four minute video about in and opposed phase imaging. Uh, Radiographics, if you're unaware, has these podcasts. Uh, they do have uh, some other physics uh, things about them. Uh, but Radiographics Online, if you're a fan of like getting five minute snippets, of things I would check this out uh, just really excellent things you know you can look at a five-minute podcast if there's something you just can't wrap your brain around maybe it's staging cholangiocarcinoma maybe it's something physics related if you go to YouTube or uh, go to the radiographics podcast site you can find it it's really excellent and I think they particularly covered this in and out of phase imaging well so I'm going to show it real quick Chemical shift imaging affords the radiologist the opportunity to assess the cellular composition of tissues. This article in the current issue of Radiographics from Anup Shetty and authors from the Malincrot Institute of Radiology begins with a brief review of the physics underlying type 1 and type 2 chemical shift, with type 2 chemical shift on gradient echo imaging showing intravoxel fat and water as signal canceling on opposed phase images at a TE of 2.2 milliseconds as compared to the additive signal seen on in-phase images. An added benefit of dual gradient echo sequences is the ability to assess for signal loss due to magnetic susceptibility associated with the T2 star effect and can be used to assess for the presence of paramagnetic and superparamagnetic species such as ferritin, hemosiderin, deoxyhemoglobin and extracellular methemoglobin, metals, air, calcium, and melanin. After detailing echo times for in and out of phase chemical shift imaging at 1.5 and 3.0 Tesla, the authors delve into the clinical applications of chemical shift signal intensity loss, which are listed in Table 2. Adrenal adenoma characterization is perhaps the most common application of chemical shift imaging. Although unenhanced and adrenal washout CT is now considered the mainstay for diagnosis 
with MR used when contrast CT is contraindicated. Thymic hyperplasia and a minority of lipid-poor angiomyolipomas that cannot be confidently characterized as such on CT are additional indications for chemical shift MR. The second major application is in the detection of hepatic steatosis seen as signal dropout on opposed phased MR images. This is particularly useful for infiltrative, focal, or mass-like steatosis. The use of chemical shift MR imaging as an adjunctive imaging feature can help in the diagnosis of pulmonary hematomas lacking calcification or fat on CT and in the diagnosis of lipid-containing chylus fluid collections and lymphangiomas in the chest and abdomen. For hepatic lesions, intralesional fat, as depicted on chemical shift MR, is a LIRADS ancillary feature favoring the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. Distinguishing benign from malignant vertebral lesions and the diagnosis of xanthrogranulomatous cholecystitis are additional applications for chemical shift MR imaging. The India Inc. artifact seen on chemical shift MR can help in the diagnosis of lipomatous hypertrophy of the intraatrial septum, fatty pancreatic lesions, and smaller renal angiomyolipomas. Magnetic susceptibility applications of chemical shift MR imaging include the detection of ferritin and hemosiderin within chronic hematomas, seen on in-phase T1-weighted images as a rim of low signal intensity, and detecting hepatic iron deposition in hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis. Non-dissolved air, as seen in pneumobilia, pneumomediastinum, and pneumatosis intestinalis, manifests as blooming artifact on longer TE in-phase images. Surgical clips, implants, and devices that may be overlooked at CT or obscured at single-shot fast spin echo or short TE gradient echo MR imaging are more readily recognized on chemical shift MR as metallic susceptibility artifact. Finally, hepatic metastases from melanoma can be seen as hyperintense T1 lesions that maintain high signal on opposed phase images. Importantly, the authors remind us that gross fat will not demonstrate the chemical shift artifact and that the India Inc. artifact can lead to the false interpretation of intralesional fat in small adrenal lesions. The article can be found at the following link. So this always confuses people because there's two competing sorry. There's two competing processes here on T1 in and out of feed imaging. And I'm pretty sloppy at throwing around the terms, and then other people are are more specific in their terms. Um, so when people strictly talk about chemical shift, um, that's where something loses signal on T1 to T uh, in phase to out of phase imaging. So that would be characteristic of intracellular lipid, which would be like in a fatty liver here. And then there's um, India ink or black boundary artifact which is where this black line occurs. Some people break it up into type one and type two um, in and out of phase or chemical shift artifact. So there's a bunch of different names uh, uh, for it, but there's two basic things. So one, if something has intracellular lipid, like in the liver, that would be um, uh, signal loss, just it gets darker on T1 out of phase. If something is macroscopic fat at water boundaries, that uh, thing will have a black line around it. All right, moving on. The correct answer here is magic angle artifact, which occurs at exactly 57 point or 54.74 degrees.
So what is magic angle artifact? So it's artifactual high signal occurring at 54.74 degrees to B0. It's confined to a region of tiny bound collagen. So it's most frequently uh, seen in MRI uh, MSK applications. For example, looking at a tendon. And I'll tell you almost uh, all examples of this or the majority of examples of this uh, that you'll see in textbooks are just like this one here. Looking at the patellar tendon where there's some artificial high signal at the insertion point and uh, you know you're going to mistake this artifact for tendinosis. Common sites where this occurs, posterior cruciate ligament, patellar tendon, uh, the supraspinatus tendon, triangular fibrocartilage in the wrist, you'll see at those sites. The physics are this occurs in sequences with a short TE, so they tend to be T1 weighted and PD or proton density weighted. You can also see it on GRE sequences. How do you fix it? Well, it's not as evident on longer pulse sequences or longer TE sequences like T2 weighted imaging. So if you lengthen out the TE, then it's going to go away. Uh, and then look at other things. So like if you really have tendinosis or a tendon tear, you'll have anatomic changes. Tendinosis will have uh, chronic thickening. Uh, so that's how you differentiate magic angle from tendinosis. <laughs>
physics, it's more visible on the phase encoding direction, but it's present on both the frequency and phase encoding directions. Um, uh, it's related to a complex mathematical artifact from the Fourier transform. And you're thinking to yourself, he doesn't really know what causes it. And if you're thinking that, you would be correct. It's uh, just complex math. All right, common. Uh, so this is very commonly seen in fluid-filled structures on T2 and fat boundaries on T1. So here's the Gibbs or truncation artifact in real life. I actually made this uh, um, uh, mistake once when I was moonlighting as a resident uh, where I questioned a syrinx on a cerebral spine or on a uh, cervical spine MRI. And what was is this is probably the most commonly shown uh, artifact where it looks like there's an artificial syrinx here in the center of the cord and it's just related to Gibbs or truncation artifact here uh, at the cord uh, CSF boundary interface. I made this mistake because I was moonlighting at a place that had a really, really terrible old MRI scanner and just everyone that read off of it knew that this artifact occurred. Uh, the key that I should have known it was artifactual is that you really only saw it on one of the pulse sequences. It wasn't reproduced on the various other pulse sequences that you saw. It was not reproduced on the axial images. If it really was a syrinx, then uh, it should have been present on uh, all of the pulse sequences and every plane uh, that was obtained. So that was my mistake. But the, uh, the people that read off of this crappy old scanner just knew that it was an artifact that occurred and ignored it. How do you fix it? Well, you can increase your matrix size. Uh, the key often is increasing the number of phase encoding steps, which of course makes the image acquisition longer. You can use smoothing, smoothening filters, which are a complex math reconstruction way of doing it. Uh, requires newer software, of course, which will cost you money. And if it's at a, a boundary with fat, like in the subcutaneous fat anteriorly, you could use a fat saturation band. Uh, the key is a real syrinx would be seen on all pulse sequences in every plane, so it's actually pretty easy if you just see it one. As a general MRI rule, uh, this happens on MRCPs and looking at stones and biliary flow artifact as well. If you can't see it on at least two different series in two orthogonal planes, you have to stop and think that maybe it was artifactual. Uh, so again, this is just an illustration of an artifactual uh, syrinx caused by Gibbs truncation artifact. So this is aliasing or wraparound artifact. This is really useful to show funny pictures because you can show pictures of like someone's hand in their abdomen or uh, you know someone's hand on their butt that kind of thing um, uh, and this is just a, a wraparound artifact so this artifact is best fixed by the correct answer is enlarging the field of view so this is aliasing or wraparound and it occurs when a field of view is smaller than the body part being imaged the excluded part of the body is projected on the opposite end of the image and the classic thing seen here are arms right so like seeing an arm or a hand in the middle of the abdomen uh, here in this example uh, the subcutaneous fat is actually excluded from the field of view and it wraps around and ended up in the center part of the image uh, 3D sequences, you can actually uh, wrap the bottom of an image stack to the top. So you could like, if you're doing the abdomen, you could see, I don't know, like a bowel loop superimposed on the diaphragm. The physics, this is caused by undersampling and it's usually in the phase encoding direction. This is kind of a complex uh, artifact to understand. And so I'd encourage you to investigate it further if you don't understand what I'm about to say. Um, I found a lot of videos on the internet that are actually pretty good at explaining it, probably better explaining it than I am. Um, but they're just so long, I don't want to include them in here. You can just YouTube, you know, wrap around artifact uh, and, and, and find one of them because there's a lot of them out there. Uh, but basically, if you think about it, uh, if you have a field of view and you're excluding... Um, uh, a portion of the body like this portion of the body even though it's not within the field of view it is going to be exposed to those radio frequency pulses so the hydrogen atoms within these parts of the body are going to be um, 
creating signal through the whole process and even though they're outside the field of view the signal that they're generating unless you take steps to accommodate for it are going to be shown within your field of view right so um, you'll get aliasing or wraparound uh, some of the keys here are uh, signal detection and MRI is done at these predefined intervals even though the signal decay is continuous so like we have to put on a given time to detect signals so we do that even with the knowledge that the signal decay is continuing it, it may be starting before we listen to the uh, listen for the signal and the decay may continue after we we're done listening for it and so we have to pick a sampling rate and the sampling rate needs to be at least two times the highest frequency that's occurring in the signal. This is called the Nyquist rate because if we sample at lower rates below that, the MRI machine and signal detection can't really separate high versus low frequencies um, uh, because those signals uh, get confused. And uh, what that does is those differences in frequency will actually become the alias and they'll be put in the wrong location, i.e. in the center of a field of view when really they were in the periphery outside of it. The spatial localization uh, occurs related to that frequency signature, right? We use different gradient coils to give each spin a little different frequency. And uh, so if we're, we're not sampling at the right rate or if we're sampling at a different rate that we should be, then that frequency signature gets all scrambled up and it gets put in the center of an image when in reality it should be in the periphery. So higher frequency generally is in the peripherally of the image. And so if something artificially gets assigned to a lower frequency, then it will be artificially put into the uh, central portion. So that's kind of my way to explain it the way I always have thought about it. Although I've always found this to be a little complex. Um, so feel free to look into other sources if you need more explanation. Uh, really, all you need to know is that aliasing equals enlarge the field of view <laughs> uh, for your multiple choice test, right? Uh, but how do you fix aliasing? You enlarge the field of view. You can use a saturation band for any areas outside the field of view. There is anti-aliasing software, which uses mathematics and magic that's beyond my knowledge base. You can swap the phase and frequency encoding directions to try and get that uh, whatever's being projected in the center image out of the area of interest. And you can use a surface coil to reduce signal outside the area of interest. Honestly, we rarely see aliasing in uh, kind of real life because the technologist, if they notice this, are going to throw away that series do accommodations, change up parameters, enlarge field of views, uh, move arms if arms are in the way, uh, and repeat the sequence before it's even sent to us. Unless it's particularly funny, like someone's hand on their butt, and then they will send it to us so that we can all enjoy that. All right, so uh, the last slide here is um, you know spikes in K-space. So these are alternating dark and bright lines. They tend to be a little bit thicker than like what you would see from like a herringbone artifact. Um, they're erroneous detection of signals, usually from RF arcs in the scan room, which are from a loose electrical connection. You really have to call a service representative. So if you remember nothing else from this uh, talk, remember if you have an artifact that you see over and over and over, you have to call a service representative. And um, most of these artifacts or many are occurred by like, weird electrical and electromagnetic pulses in and around the room that's utilized. There's a really excellent table in the Crack the Core book about artifacts, and I would say that it is worth memorizing. Um, so hopefully you can identify the artifacts that were talked about here. Uh, I would identify every artifact that's being able, being talked about in that table, and it's really an excellent table, and uh, I would uh, spend some time memorizing that. I thank you for paying attention to all of my various physics lectures and uh, hope you have a great day.